Good evening and welcome to the September edition of the Thought Leaders Lecture Series from Space Center Houston. I am Dr. Randall Urban, Vice President and Chief Research Officer at the University of Texas Medical Branch, UTMB. UTMB is the proud sponsor of the 2021 Thought Leaders Series. Tonight we will learn about TRISH, the Translational Research Center for Space Health. Trish's collaborative research partners work together to lessen human risk on lengthy space voyages like the journey to Mars. While Trish scientists follow a bench to spaceflight research model, UTMB's translational researchers also collaborate to bring new discoveries from bench to bedside to improve health throughout Texas and beyond. The goal of translational research is to transform scientific discoveries into practical solutions. It's a concept especially important to biomedical research of all sorts. We value the contributions of these researchers at Trish and UTMB who join forces on these vital projects and look forward to their future accomplishments. Thank you for joining us tonight. We hope you enjoy the lecture. Hello, I'm William T. Harris, President and CEO of Space Center Houston. We're a dynamic science and space exploration learning destination and nonprofit science center. We also have the privilege of serving as the official visitor center for NASA Johnson Space Center. We share the story of human exploration, past, present, and future with more than 1.25 million visitors annually from around the world. Thank you for joining Space Center Houston's Thought Leader Series program, Overcoming the Challenges of Human Space Flight, presented by University of Texas Medical Branch. Our Thought Leaders Series brings you space and science experts from around the country to provide insights and perspectives on space exploration. Space Center Houston provides robust learning experiences that enable you to be part of NASA's mission. In addition to our robust collections, we provide changing exhibits and live programming, so there's always something new. You can discover how space inspires technological, cultural, and social progress. Experience our new fall exhibit, Be the Astronaut, coming up October 2nd through January 2nd. Celebrate Halloween at Galaxy Frights, presented by Reliant every weekend in October. It's a family-friendly Halloween experience with costume parades, candy stations, and science activities. You'll experience one of our most popular experiences, the NASA Tram Tour, which takes guests behind the scenes at NASA Johnson Space Center to the astronaut training facility and historic mission control. Plan your journey with us today and purchase your tickets online at spacecenter.org. In order to send astronauts further into the cosmos, NASA must solve many challenges of how we send humans into deep space. NASA's Human Research Program is partnering with the Translational Research Institute for Space Health, or TRISH, to research and develop innovative practices and approaches to reduce the risks to humans on long duration exploration missions, including plans for astronauts traveling to and from Mars. In this episode, we'll learn more about this groundbreaking partnership with TRISH and the fascinating research underway. It's my honor to welcome our panelists today for overcoming the challenges of human space flight, including Trish Executive Director, Dr. Dorit Donavell, Trish Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Emanuel Orquieta, and Mr. Jimmy Wu, an instructor at Baylor College of Medicine Center for Space Medicine and Associate Director of the Exploration Medicine Laboratory. Our first presenter, Dr. Donavell, serves as Executive Director of TRISH, which is a NASA-funded innovation research and development program that finds, funds, and facilitates disruptive human health and performance solutions for astronauts traveling in deep space. In her previous role as Deputy Chief Scientist of National Space Biomedical Research Institute, Dorit led both domestic and international research programs that bridged academic, industry, and government resources deliver fast and cost-effective, tangible results. She's the recipient of multiple honors from NASA and was awarded the NSBRI Pioneer Award. Our second panelist, Dr. Orquieta, holds a medical degree from Anhuac University in Mexico City and a Master of Science in Aerospace Medicine from Wright State University in Dayton, Ohio. He completed a diploma in emergency medicine and then worked for Mexico City's police department as a flight surgeon in the Helicopter Emergency Medical Service, Condors, where he participated in hundreds of rescue missions and aeromedical evacuations within Mexico City metropolitan area. Manuel has volunteered in medical missions in underserved regions throughout Mexico and in Nigeria. He was a volunteer paramedic for the Mexican Red Cross for more than five years. 
In 2017, he was selected to participate in the Human Exploration Research Analog, or HERA, in the 11 mission, where he spent 30 days in a capsule simulating a deep space mission. Our third panelist, Mr. Jimmy Wu, develops, evaluates, and integrates technologies that will reduce human system risk during exploration spaceflight missions for Baylor College of Medicine Center for Space Medicine. He also serves as Trish Senior Biomedical Engineer, looking to push the frontier of technology and engineering for addressing human risk in spaceflight. Jimmy's role with Trish also includes team lead of medical technology projects and managing biomedical research to be conducted on private commercial space flights. Previously, he worked at NASA Johnson Space Center for 14 years, providing engineering, integration, operations, and research and development, information technology, and project management support to projects addressing human health and performance during spaceflight missions. What an amazing panel. Welcome to all of you. We're first going to hear from Dorit. Hi, everybody. I'm so excited to be here today and to tell you about our research. I wanted you to see this first slide with the question mark because most of you are probably scratching your head going, space health research, what is that? Well, you're gonna hear all about it. You're gonna be experts by the time we leave here today. But I also want to talk a little bit about how I got here. How the heck did somebody like me end up at doing space health research? Well, it started out when I was 10 years old. My family immigrated to the United States and and I have to say that nobody in my family had ever gone to college. I was the first one. And they were really excited because I was really interested in biology. And I had this fantastic teacher and she really inspired me to study biology in college. And over the door in her classroom, in my high school, it said, through this door, walk the future biologists. And I was so excited to actually make that come true. From being a biologist and getting my degree and getting my doctorate degree, I decided to go into private industry and really make a difference in terms of finding new medications for a variety of diseases. So I worked in a small biotech company for about eight years. And then an amazing opportunity came up and I got to work with an organization that was actually studying how to keep humans healthy in space. And after doing that for a few years, I had this tremendous opportunity to actually become the leader of this new institute that was founded by NASA. And so I'm really excited to be here today and to bring with me a couple of our team members to tell you all about the research that we do. So we are Trish, our name is very long. And so we have a short name, and we do some very interesting things. What we do in short is we seek out all over the United States and all over the world, and we find innovations in science and technology, in medical research, in clinical care, in psychological care that will actually enable any human, no matter what the color of their skin is, their age or their sex, to be absolutely healthy and to be able to perform their jobs to the best of their abilities while in the space environment. So why is that even something that we're concerned about? We are actually a, a consortium institution based at Baylor College of Medicine here in Houston. And my colleagues that are here with me today are like myself, faculty members at Baylor. But we work very closely with other faculty members with Massachusetts Institute for Technology, or MIT, and the California Institute. For and you could see that we have the Gulf Coast, the East Coast, and the West Coast working together to find the newest innovations in science and medicine on behalf of spaceflight. So what is it that we do that's different than what NASA does? You're probably scratching your head right across the street from Space Center Houston is Johnson Space Center. And we all know they are tremendously successful in getting humans to space and bringing them back quite healthy. And we've been doing that over the last 20 years. So in fact, NASA has been incredibly successful. And what we basically have been brought in to do is to think about beyond what is currently happening right now, which is the International Space Station. We have people living there and have been living there 
for the last 20 years continuously. And those humans are coming back relatively healthy, despite the fact that they are exposed to a slightly higher dose of radiation being higher up in our atmosphere, and the fact that they are being exposed to complete lack of gravity or they're in the absence of gravity, which affects the entire body. We're, we figured out how to keep those humans healthy. However, NASA has set its sights on going back to the moon. And while humans did go to the moon uh, several decades ago and came back safely, those missions were very short missions. They were there for just a couple days and came right back. What NASA is intending to do is actually go to the moon and stay for a while. And that means a higher degree of exposure to radiation. That means a longer exposure to the partial gravity that's on the moon. That means exposure to lunar dust, which is actually fairly toxic to not only humans, but also electronics. And beyond the moon, we have set our sights to going to Mars eventually. And that is a very long trip. It will take upwards of a year and a half if we just do a flyby and possibly two to three years if we're actually planning to stay and do some surface activities on the Mars surface. And being so far away creates all kinds of problems. And so NASA really wanted a partner, an innovation institute like Trish, to really be thinking about those leaps, uh, those advances in space, uh, science, and in um, scientific research, and biomedical research, and medicine, and all kinds of capabilities uh, that the best and the brightest minds on Earth today can bring to NASA in order to keep those humans who are going to be going to the moon and to Mars safe and healthy, just like we're doing so on the ISS today. So what is the problem with going to space? Why is this so difficult for humans? Well, we all got used to being in a closed environment during the pandemic. We got a little stir crazy being in our homes and socially isolating from our friends and families. Our restaurants were closed. We couldn't go to a movie. And we didn't even go to the office anymore. So the isolation is even much more severe for astronauts because they are going to be cooped up in a fairly small confined space. That's one issue. And that could cause a problem for mental health, and keeping themselves motivated for their work over a long period of time. Pandemic isolation has only been about a year or so. Imagine a three-year isolation. The gravitational field is one that is definitely a concern. Right now, our bodies are used to having a gravitational force from the Earth, and that's important for the health of our bones, our muscles, and our hearts, as well as where the fluids are distributed in our bodies. When you take away that gravitational field, all kinds of things change. Our heart becomes deconditioned, our muscles and bones um, no longer are as healthy as they would under a gravitational field. But we figured out ways to get around some of those problems. The hostile environment. We have uh, a closed loop environment where we're relying on filters and energy driven electronics to clean the air for us to make sure that we're not exhaling too much carbon dioxide and not cleaning it up enough so that our oxygen levels are appropriate, so that we don't have any kind of uh, toxic gases being emitted by any of the machinery that's on board the craft. And there are actually um, things in the spaceflight environment, like particulates that are going through space, micro saddle um, uh, meteorites, et cetera, that can actually cause damage to the vehicle itself. So that presents some challenges as well. The distance from Earth, what does that mean? Right now, if there's an emergency, astronauts can come back from the ISS back to Earth within a matter of a few hours. Whereas once we go to the moon, it's going to take a couple days. So those astronauts will really have to be more self-sufficient and have to deal with problems autonomously, taking care of themselves. On a way to Mars, that's a whole different ball game. We have to provide them with the capabilities that they're going to have to take care of themselves without support from Earth. They will not be able to get resupply of fresh foods and clothes and all the kinds of things that we take for granted right now on the International Space Station. So the distance from Earth definitely is an issue, and my colleagues will speak more about that. Radiation. We really can't protect humans sufficiently from all the space radiation that humans will be experiencing 
once we leave low Earth orbit, so the International Space Station is still fairly close to Earth. It is higher up and it is getting slightly more radiation than all of us here get on the surface of the planet, but it's still within the protection of our atmosphere. Once we go to the moon or we go to the Mars surface and even on the, on the um, trip to Mars, we're really not able to protect the humans uh, because the shielding that would be required to sufficiently protect the humans from galactic cosmic rays, for example, is so massive and so heavy, it's just not feasible. So the humans will be exposed to a lot more radiation that we're currently experiencing with astronauts on the ISS today. So we have to solve those problems before we can go to Mars and keep humans healthy. So I wanted to just make a point here is that space and the environment of spaceflight, which includes the gravitational uh, field changes, the loss of gravity, as well as the radiation that we get from the environment, as well as the confinement, as well as the distance from Earth, all of those parameters create an extreme environment where every single physiological system of the body is challenged. And so it's no easy matter to think about those astronauts when they go to space, they have to be really in peak condition uh, in order to withstand all of these uh, assaults essentially on their physiology and their mental health. And they do so because they are screened very carefully before they enter, they're trained really well, and they keep themselves in shape. However, when we start to think about commercial spaceflight, when regular people will be going to space, all those similar stressors will actually come to bear on people who may not have trained as hard as the astronaut or may not be as healthy to start with as the astronauts. But our team is actually figuring it out for all humans, because what we learn about regular people who go to space may actually help us figure out how to handle it when an astronaut may develop a medical condition on the way to Mars that we didn't see when they first started. So what our institute does is it actually innovates for all humans to be healthy in space and on Earth. And what I did here is just show you five examples of the 100 projects that we have funded since we, since we started on October 1st, 2016. So we've only been in operations for about five years, and we have funded 100 different science projects. And what you see here starting on the left-hand side is a symbol for DNA. So we are investing in all kinds of new ways to create just-in-time therapeutics using DNA so it's similar to the technology that was recently used with the mRNA vaccines for the pandemic. And so we are looking at new ways to create therapeutics that won't take a really long time because we just don't know what kinds of diseases or problems may develop that we don't even think about today on the way to Mars. We want to provide the crew with capabilities that are quite flexible using nucleotides or DNA type approaches or even RNA. What you see with the circle with the slide on the top left there, that is microfluidics device. That is a capability of checking your blood for all kinds of health markers, which my colleagues may talk about as well, for what you would get today when you go for an annual exam at the doctor's office. And they take your blood and they run your liver enzymes, your kidney enzymes, and they get to find out whether your immune system is working okay. And all of those things will be able to provide the astronauts with those capabilities on the way to Mars because there won't be a lab for them to run their blood on the way to Mars in order to check for their health. The other top figure you see there is a schematic of the stomach. And what we've done there is we're actually invested in a project that allows you to put a device that sits in the stomach that can release really healthy bacteria, microbes, to enrich the microbiome on the way to Mars. Because the astronauts going to Mars will not have a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables. And in fact, what you see there with the lettuce is an experiment that we're trying to see whether we can get plants that they will be able to grow in a small amount to actually make medicines for them as well. And so we're experimenting with all kinds of ways to deliver things that we take for granted here on Earth, for example, microbiome from fresh fruits and vegetables, as well as new medications 
that they may not be able to take with them on the way to Mars because they don't know that they need them yet. So the ability to create new therapeutics as needed on the way to Mars is what we're shooting for. On the bottom right, you see a, a schematic representative of what we call the human's organs on a chip. And what this is, is we're able to take normal human's blood cells and we can remove the stem cells out of those and we can get those stem cells to make miniaturized little organs that replicate your own heart, your own kidney, your own lungs. And those are specialized and put on a, on a tiny little glass chip. And now we can look and see and test this under conditions of simulated space radiation. So we can learn ahead of time whether your particular liver or heart or kidney cells will be susceptible to the damage from space radiation before you even go to Mars. And then what we could do is test the various therapeutics or medications that might work to protect you. And we could see, does this particular medication protect your heart from space radiation? It may work for you and not for me, but I can do this ahead of time before we actually all together go to Mars and are affected by the space radiation environment. Come check out our website for the other many, many, many innovations that Trish has invested in. So what we're really excited about, Trish is actually launching a brand new research program looking at the health of regular people going to space. And this is being launched by SpaceX with the Inspiration4 crew this is the very first all civilian, all private, completely um, non-governmental mission uh, that will orbit the Earth, go into orbit for three days. And those humans have agreed to participate in our science experiments. And what you see on the right is a mission patch that we developed with all of the researchers that are taking part in this from all over the country. We have researchers from Arizona, we have re researchers from Pennsylvania, we have researchers from Texas, and we're really excited. And uh, we hope that you will be able to watch this and um, learn about the science that we're gonna perform. So why are we doing this with regular people? Well, take a look at them. They're very diverse. You have two women, you have a woman of color, you have the, the youngest person ever, to go into space in orbital space is 30 years old and she's actually a, a childhood cancer survivor who has a prosthetic in her. So these kinds of people have never been to space. These individuals, while the governmental space programs are actually increasing the number of women and increasing the number of people of color that are going to space, we're going to start to see more and more diversity in the kinds of people that are actually going on commercial space flight. And we want to study all of them because why? Personalized medicine, that's why. Because what may work for me or a particular NASA astronaut of a particular demographic may not work for people who are slightly younger or slightly older or of a different kind of environmental exposure than your typical NASA astronaut. And the other reason is that we feel that we can leverage a tremendous amount of investment and sweat equity by private spaceflight companies, as well as private individuals who are raising a lot of money, not just to reduce childhood cancer through their inspiration for work that they're doing to fundraise uh, for St. Jude's, but also because uh, the SpaceX team has really implemented in a wonderful way the research that NASA cares about. So this is a tremendous opportunity to partner with using public funding with the private industry and everybody wins in this case. And with that, I am going to ask for the last slide and turn it back to you. Someday very soon, all of us are going to get a view of Earth from space and hopefully it won't be too much longer in the future my belief it'll definitely happen within the next 50 years. I believe that we are very much at the cusp of where commercial aviation was 100 years ago, where most of us couldn't even imagine getting on an airplane so easily and flying around the world. I think space will become exactly the same within 50 years time. Thank you so much for your attention and I hope to uh, answer some questions in a little bit.
Thank you so much, Dorit. That was absolutely fascinating. It's so multifaceted to hear about the work of Trish, and I know we were just scratching the surface. We'll now hear from our next panelist, Dr. Orquieta. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. I want to tell you today a story, a brief story about human spaceflight, and I'm going to tell you how we have been providing medical care to these very unique people going to space, how we have done it in the past, how we do it currently on the space station, and how we plan to do it on Mars to the ultimate frontier. So we have been uh, for the last 20 plus years on the space station, and it's incredible that every single day for the last 20 years, day or night, it doesn't matter where on the planet you are, there has always been at least one human orbiting the Earth every single moment of the day. That is an absolutely re remarkable human thing that we have been able to do. And to me, it's, it's more important that we haven't had any major medical emergencies during those 20 years. We have to think that the human body is not designed to be in this environment. Us as humans have been designed to live in a one gravity environment here on the Earth, under the protection of the atmosphere. And these incredible humans and all of the technologies around them have been able to live in this very unique environment and this very hostile uh, environment outside of the Earth for the last 20 years without any major incidents. So one of the reasons why we have been able to do it, uh, to do that is number one, because of the, all of the technology, all of the research and all of the people that have been involved in this for the last 20 years and before, the, the really original astronauts that um, went um, uh, for the first time to uh, to space, the Gemini, the Mercury missions, and, and all of those uh, folks. Uh, but one of the main reasons is because we have continuous access to them by telemedicine. If somebody gets sick on the space station, if anybody has any minor uh, concerns, any symptoms, they can grab the phone and they can call mission control. They say, Houston, we have a problem. Houston, I don't feel good. And there's going to be a flight surgeon 24-7 waiting for that call to happen and there's not only that flight surgeon they have a list of the best medical experts in the world and in the united states so they can call them and ask them if there's anything else that they need to do it doesn't matter where the space station is so that's a huge capability and if any of those astronauts get sick that he or she requires to come back to earth they can do so in a matter of three or four hours and there is a team that is ready to get them if they get if they get sick they also have any type of medications they might need. We have resupply missions going uh, to the space station every month or so. So they have a continuous supply of equipment, of medications and of, of medical support 24 seven. Now the next stage, and we have been there um, in, in the Apollo missions, is the moon. The moon is very far away compared to, to, to the space station, but it's still relatively close as we if we compare it to a mission to Mars. Now the challenges there are a little bit more difficult to solve than on the space station. These astronauts are three or four days distance from Earth. Uh, if there's a medical emergency, of course, they can come back in a matter of days, but it's not three days. It's now three to four days. Still, there's uh, almost real time communications. There's just a, a brief seconds of, of delay, but we don't have the capability to, to resupply as, as we do on the, on the space station. Now on the space station, astronauts, if they have to do any type of diagnostics or any other things that they need, they have experts on, on Earth that can give them guidance. And this is an example. This is one of the ultrasound machines and uh, there's always someone on Earth giving them guidance if they need to do that. This is one of the most uh, impressive images that I like to show all the time. This is the first time that as humankind, we saw the Earth rising on the moon rather than seeing the moon rising on the Earth. So this is an absolutely incredible image. And this shows you a little bit the distance between the Earth and the moon, uh, but you can still see that blue little spot where you know your family, your friends and everybody else is. This is an image of um, some astronauts doing some experiments on uh, one of the, the stations that we had around the same time as, as we went to the moon. And you can see that, you know, we still have a lot of capabilities here. We have a lot of space. And this is going to change in the next slide I'm going to show you. Now, this is one of the most recent images that was taken by one of the rovers on, on Mars. This is actually a real image from the Mars surface. And if you see that little dot there, that is actually not the Earth. You, you, you cannot even see the Earth from that distance. It will be just like a tiny star. This is actually the sun. And if here, here on Earth, we're used to see the sun, actually like a, like a really nice red, yellow, um, just uh, image coming out or, or coming down from, from, from the horizon. But imagine being on Mars and seeing that as the sun, and you don't even know where's, that, where's the Earth, where's your friends, where's your family, where's everything that you like and, and everything that you love because it's so far away. And why is this really important from the medical perspective and from all the technologies that we need to develop for these people going to Mars? It's because of the distance, of the massive distance between the Earth and Mars. 
Now, if we want to do uh, telemedicine or we want to do any type of, of uh, telesupport to these astronauts, we cannot do it in the same way that I was telling you that we have been doing it on the space station or as we will able to be able to be able to do it on, on the moon. In this case, if you have a medical emergency and you just grab the phone and you try to call uh, Houston again, it's going to take roughly 20 minutes for that message just to come through the Earth. So you say, Houston, I have a problem. It's going to take 20 minutes for them to hear it. And if they tell you back, oh, what is your problem? It takes another 20 minutes. And in the medical field, there is what we call the golden hour. It's the first 60 minutes of a medical emergency that you need to initiate the treatment so that you can stabilize the person after a medical condition happens. So imagine if we try to do the same approach uh, when you're on Mars, you also took 40 minutes of that time. So we, we cannot rely on those type of communications. So everything that we need to develop for these type of, of very extreme missions, a very unique environment, needs to be self-sufficient, it needs to be self-reliant, and more importantly, it needs to be completely autonomous from communications to Earth. For us to do this, we need to have a large pool of participants. We need to have a large pool of people that have gone into space because we have to use the three Ps, uh, as we call in, in the medical field. It's uh, prevention, prediction, and personalized medicine. And for us to be able to do three things, we need a large pool of participants. And this is where commercial space flight comes into the equation to give us a large pool of, of, of people that have flown to space from a more diverse background. And when we're looking into this, we really have to think of science fiction. It's really science fiction that is going to bring us the technologies that we need for these type of unique missions. And in, in my case, I always get inspired from, from uh, um, science fiction on, on trying to see how we can solve these problems. And I'm sure that a lot of the things that we have seen in science fiction in the last 20 or 30 years, we'll, we'll see them coming to fruition in the next uh, 10, 15, or perhaps 20 years. Uh, what is this? It's a tricoder, right? If, if, if we remember about, about this device, it was a one size fits all device, like a unique device that you just scan whatever is wrong with the person. It tells you exactly what it is. It includes like an ultrasound, x rays, uh, all types of physicians inside. So this will be the ultimate solution, right? And even though sadly we don't have a solution like this, uh, non, non, not only for not for space, but for terrestrial healthcare, we have a lot of technologies that are getting close to being uh, to achieve this. Uh, in fact, uh, there's now ultrasound machines that are completely miniaturized. You just plug them to your cell phone. It's a single probe. There's an artificial intelligence embedded into the system that can tell you, okay, put your ultrasound machine on your chest. If you want to see your heart, just move it a little bit to the right. Uh, too much, no, a little bit less, and then just keep it there. And then the ultrasound machine will get a clinical grade ultrasound image as if you were in one of the best medical centers in the world. And we're getting there. This already exists. And uh, a lot of other technologies are moving into these capabilities. And, and um, um, the, the, the ultimate one will be combining all of them into a single device. Like, now, uh, if you like science fiction, you remember this as Hal. Uh, this is the guy that was sometimes good, sometimes bad in the missions. But from the medical care, from the medical perspective, how cool would it be to have some type of ultimate physician that knows all of the medical specialties into the spacecraft doesn't have to call back to Earth. And this computer can also tell if there's any changes in the vehicle, if there's, let's say, any increase of CO2, there's any changes in the atmosphere, any change in the temperature. And then this uh, machine will also know exactly how you work, how your physiology is different from the other astronauts. And it could even predict something that is going to happen to your medical condition. So this machine could tell you, okay, you need to start taking this medication because in three days you're going to have a headache. So this is how we think of the future of healthcare that 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 is going to be developed for base flight for these very, very unique uh, situations. And I think in my mind, the ultimate is this. This is what we're all trying to achieve. Not um, space flight for only a few, but space, space flight for everybody. And we're starting to see this happening. We, we, we're having four civilians that have never been to space, all of them with regular jobs like you and I, going to space for the first time without any other astronauts that have been into space before. And I think that in the next probably 20, 30, or maybe 40 years, we'll have the capability to go to space as a family vacation. And this will need a lot of capabilities, right? We'll need pediatricians in space. We will need maybe neonatologists in space. We will need to develop all of these areas that we do not traditionally think that are required for space flight so that we can safely send anybody to space. And this is how we think that uh, space will be democratized and, and will be equitable for everybody. Thank you very much for your time. I am looking forward to answering your questions. Thank you.
Thank you so much. That was absolutely fascinating. And now our third panelist, Mr. Jimmy Wu. Jimmy. Thank you, William. And thank you to Dorit and Emmanuel for a great uh, discussion so far over what Trisha's mission is and what we're doing to support space health for, for all of humanity. So I want to actually talk a bit more on my experience um, just so that uh, our audience can know kind of what's being done right now. What, ha what has NASA done so far? So you kind of see where we are and then where Trish is wanting to go. And so my story actually starts basically on this picture. If you look, um, if you're not familiar, this is the city of Houston at night from space. And you could basically summarize my life in this one photo because I grew up here. I went to school here. And then I started working at Johnson Space Center down at NASA, down in Clear Lake uh, for 14 years right out of school. And then right after that, I got an opportunity to join uh, Baylor College of Medicine and Trish. So really a large bulk of my life is in this one photo. And what I want to talk about is that experience and, and what and how my contributions to, to NASA and the human health and uh, hopefully be able to uh, create a, a, an idea or a vision of how uh, this, this one image could also be translated to what we're looking for on Mars. So very early on, uh, right after school, I started working down at NASA Johnson Space Center. And just like the hazards that Dorit talked about, some of it you can't really experience on Earth because we just don't have an environment here. And so we, I had the opportunity to be able to fly on a zero-G plane to experience zero gravity. And here I'm trying to uh, do a um, ambu bag um, uh, respiration of a mannequin. And uh, while this photo is a bit, you know, kind of for show, um, there's actually a big part of this that isn't realistic, and that is that I'm actually free floating. And in space, you wouldn't actually do that. You would actually want to be immobilized or at least uh, grounded to some stabilized against something so that you're not moving around uh, because of gravity, because there's no gravity, there's nothing to pull you down downwards so, and keep you in place. So you actually move very easily. And, and so that's one thing that you have to kind of understand with doing medicine and doing anything in space, especially in a zero-g environment, is just how much different it is from our experience on Earth. And so learning that and understanding that helped me understand how to now better, to not just uh, provide better engineering hardware uh, in medical hardware for our astronauts, but also how they would use it and how we train them. So after this, I got an opportunity to actually get some hardware that I was able to work on and support onto the International Space Station. And so just like Dorit talked about and, and Emmanuel talked about, this is a unique place. It's an engineering marvel. They do amazing science on there. Seven humans are living on the space station and they're healthy. We've kept them healthy. We've learned a lot about space flight over these last 60 years. But as Emmanuel and Dorit talked about, we're actually still fairly close to, to Earth. And because of that, we have a lot of ways to be able to come back if something goes wrong. But all right, the idea is to not have anything go wrong in the first place. So we actually do a lot of, we have a lot of our medical equipment that actually just tries to keep the astronauts healthy in space and prevent them from being injured or sick in the first place. And I'm gonna go over a few of those. And actually some of this hardware actually supported myself. I actually got some of this hardware on orbit. Here we have a uh, East astronaut, Thomas Bisquay, actually holding up some uh, medical equipment. So we have uh, the blue kit and a red kit are actually the medical kits, two of the medical kits that are on the International Space Station right now. And within them, they open up like a binder, like your uh, school binder at home uh, that you take to school. And in, inside there's the medical equipment, there's medications, there's all the bandages, bandages and um, other things that you, that you typically might have in your, your uh, medicine cabinet or in your closet at home but we've organized it in such a way so that's easier to manage because as you can see, they would just kind of float around if they were just laying on a shelf. So we have them kind of contained in this enclosure that better organizes it and better allows us to resupply it. And there's also, uh, you can kind of see the lower, there's actually a uh, external, uh, automated external defibrillator. And so uh, we're actually concerned about uh, some sort of cardiac event happening on the space station. So we actually have one of these devices on the NASA space station to perform, help facilitate performing a CPR on the astronaut if it's needed. Here, we, Dr. Yaketa earlier had shown an image of an ultrasound. And so I'm showing another one here, mainly because uh, you can see something different about Chris Cassidy. He's actually tethered. You can see a little bungee that's going around his, his shoulder, his neck. So that keeps him from floating away so that he's not trying to struggle with just stabilizing himself 
and also trying to stabilize the probe that's on Luca Parmentano's neck, that type of training, that type of operations, understanding how to do medicine, how to do operations in spaceflight is, is really important. And so this was one of the one of the key things I learned when developing and, and providing ultrasound capabilities aboard the International Space Station is it's not just getting the hardware on orbit, it's how do you actually acquire the high quality images that we need. And as Dr. Yuketa talked about earlier, we are now moving on to the next generation ultrasounds that are even smaller and more, even more easier to use, such as using such technologies as artificial intelligence to help facilitate getting that image as quickly and as effectively as possible. And here we have Karen Nyberg doing an eye exam. And so this was one of the concerns that Dorita put up in one of her slides was the eyes. The eyes actually are getting affected by spaceflight. And this was actually something we didn't realize until about 10 years ago. It hadn't, uh, we hadn't been flying in space long enough in terms of an individual flying in space long enough until the International Space Station program when astronauts were staying on in space for up to six months. Uh, because prior to that, most of the astronauts' exposure were really, really short. And so as we've started to have people stay in space longer, we're starting to see these conditions that normally wouldn't exist on Earth. And so this is a phenomenon that's actually only space specific. And because we don't know much about it, we have a lot of equipment on orbit to try to understand it. And a lot of it is Earth-based technology that you would see in a uh, optometrist office or ophthalmologist office that you, when you go get your eye exam, this is what you would go through. But we've all been there. There, there are large devices. There's usually a, a technician or some uh, expert using it and operating it. Well, the difference here, as you can see what Karen's doing, is she's actually doing this exam herself. And the technology that Trish is working on is trying to further advance that so it's easier to use so that it isn't just something you need, you're dependent on expertise to be able to collect the data uh, appropriately. And so this is one of the key messages I wanted to share about what the technology we're working on here at Trish is. If you can see in all these three images that I put up is the astronauts are expected to take care of themselves. We are providing the hardware and the training to allow them to do that, even though they're not medical professionals, even though they're not necessarily uh, scientists as well. And so what that could be important for is for those of us on Earth is if we can provide this hardware for to improve their health in space, imagine as this technology matures and, and it gets applied here on Earth, what that could mean for your health in your house. For you individually, if it's easy enough for someone to use in such a remote, hostile, austere environment, it should be uh, allowable for you guys to be able to do this in your own home. And so for us at Trish, even though we we say space health, it's really space health for everyone. What we learn about health in space is easily applicable to health on Earth. It's easily applicable to health in your home and easily applicable to, to health for yourself. And so we're starting to already see the industry doing that with our, um, our fitness wear, with our smart watches and things like that. That's just the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more out there that we are really actively invested in and interested in to try to advance that. And so I just want to close out by kind of going back to where I was saying about the first slide being a picture of basically of my life. Here uh, you can actually see a picture taken by the Curiosity rover in 2017, and it's looking at the night sky on Mars. And if you look very closely, there's a little dot kind of at the 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock side. That is Earth. And so as referred to earlier, a lot of us you know, I had one photo up that was my life. This is basically everyone's life. This is all of human existence, basically on four pixels. And this goes to show, this is this is a statement basically of how far away Mars is from Earth. And this is such a tremendous challenge for us to try to maintain health of our astronauts or any other individuals who choose to go to deep space and explore our solar system is how do we keep them healthy when they're so far away from the comforts of our family, our friends, of our culture? All that is doesn't exist out there. And because if you just based on this image, it basically exists in this little dot. And so this to me is a very profound image. This, this is what motivates me to continue what I can want to do because I have to try to figure out how do I allow humans to stay healthy in a place like this that not just allows them to just survive, but allows them to thrive and how it allows them to maintain well-being, allows them to maintain connection back to their, all their family and friends on Earth. And so I hope uh, this uh, conversation is, uh, is useful and it helps you think about where you want to go with your life and how you can contribute to 
helping us advance human health, uh, not just in space, but also on Earth. And thank you everyone for your time. Great, thank you, Jimmy. All three absolutely fascinating presentations. So I wanna open up our conversation. So the first thing I wanna ask you all is, it's incredible what Trish has achieved in five years with over 100 experiments. How do you prioritize and select the projects that you're going to do research on? And maybe that goes to Dorit first. Yeah, thank you, William. Um, yes, so we actually have to prioritize because we can't do it all. Um, and so what, what NASA has done is uh, prioritize the things that are absolutely game, game stoppers, things that are going to really affect the mission in terms of the health of the astronaut. And that changes with what they call uh, the design reference mission or the mission itself. So for example, what would be a, a showstopper on the surface of the moon may be a little bit different than what's a showstopper on, on the surface of Mars or on the way to Mars. So I'll give you an example. On, on the moon, for example, um, we're probably less concerned about the um, the uh, Jimmy was talking about the ocular or the vision changes because the length of stay on the moon surface that has a partial gravity, we think it's related to how long people are living in a zero gravity environment. So right now when we're thinking about the moon, those stays are fairly short. Um, and that is different when you're thinking about a Mars mission. A Mars mission is much longer. So those humans are going to have to be um, under a zero gravity environment for a much longer period of time. And we think that that vision issue, the problem with the eyes is gonna be much bigger issue. So in terms of radiation, that becomes more of an issue. The further away you are from Earth and the longer you're, you're gonna stay in a radiation environment. So depending on what mission we're solving for, that's how we prioritize. Now, NASA looks at that in terms of risks. What they've asked us to do is to do something a little bit different. They wanted us to kind of think differently, a little out of the box. And what we've tried to do with Trish is to look at, at technologies and capabilities that would be cross-cutting across multiple high priority risks. So we are actually focused on both the moon and Mars, thinking about all the different things that NASA says our top priority for those two types of missions. And we look for capabilities that can address them all in one shot. That's how we've prioritized our approach. Well, that's absolutely fascinating. And boy, that must be tough because there's so many exciting opportunities out there. So you came about because of NASA and again, to help explore much more deeply all of the, the health and ways of keeping astronauts while going into deep space. But you've also said that the commercial sector is beginning to look at Trish. Uh, what kind of projects are you doing with the commercial sector, especially as we advance space tourism? Yeah, so as the re referred to earlier, really the mission is a little bit different with the commercial sector. You know, we're the passengers there are going to be short duration leisurely trips. You know, they're up there for the view and they're up there for the experience. And so because of that, it's a different mission for them. They're not up there to necessarily be science all the time and to live and survive and figure out how to make things work uh, well in space. Um, and so we needed to look at what could we understand about the human body uh, during that time, during that brief stay they have in space so that uh, we can get the best quality data we can out of it. And the other part too is um, these are average civilians. They're not trained to be scientists. They're not trained to be clinicians. And so their skill level to do activities or tasks or procedures that are medically oriented, uh, it's not gonna be their strong suit. And so we also needed to pick um, studies that were easy to use, that were low burden, that you know didn't um, involve a lot of uh, blood and cuts, so to speak, right? Because you know some of us are squeamish with needles and squeamish with blood. So you know we we needed to pick experiments that the the general population would be uh, you know willing to participate in that wasn't too far out there and too far out of their comfort zone. Um, so uh, so we found some really fa uh, fantastic studies to support the inspiration for launch in particular, and we're hoping to continue to have that 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 portfolio of studies go onward to other uh, commercial um, uh, launches in the future so that we can get a larger data set. It isn't just a one-off with one mission with this small population. We get it across the board, a much more diverse um, user base, much more diversity in uh, the subject pool, 
Um, so we're really excited about it. This is uh, our, this is the first step in it. I think we're going to have a fantastic time next week. And and uh, yeah, and so that's uh, the, the biggest thing, like I said, is 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 understanding that the mission is a little bit different. The people involved are different. And so we had to reframe uh, the objectives of how we accomplish the science. So, uh, Emmanuel, I'm curious because you were in very much a direct care role for much of your career, working in emergency relief and other things. How did you make the transition now to more of a research role? And um, it, it's 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 really quite a career adjustment, a, a career change, going from dedicating your life really uh, to, to being a practitioner, particularly in an emergency situation, to one now being in the research sphere. Yeah, to me, it, uh, I, I feel very privileged, and sometimes I still have to pinch my my uh, my skin every day to 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 believe that I I am able to do what I what I am uh, you know my, my current job. I'm also a first generation immigrant, so it's it's even more um, powerful for me to to be able to have this job. Uh, but uh, going back to your question, I think that when you are practicing physician, you you are absolutely privileged to be able to, to touch people's lives, but you do it one by one, right? It, it, you, you have to do it uh, at, at that scale. And I think that what I really enjoy uh, being on the research side is that I am able to touch multiple people at the same time. It's it, you are able to, to, to um, come up with solutions that are going to be applicable to a large pool of, of people and then specifically in this unique environment, which is space. So I think that um, I, I enjoy a little bit more doing this type of, of, of work because it, it it is more applicable and it's, it's um, um, yeah, it, it touches multiple people at the same time. So I, I really enjoy doing that. Well, I have a question for each of you because you are doing, I have to say all the experiments are super cool, but for each of you, is there a particular experiment that's had or is moving toward application or use on Earth that you find um, intriguing, that you find really interesting or somewhat surprising in some way? Maybe to read you first, is, is there, when you think about the 100 experiments that, that have taken place through Trish over the past five, uh, five years, is there something that really jumps out at you? Well, there are many. Uh, many, 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 and and, and the, my team members will tell you uh, it's hard to keep track of all of them. I, we just can't, can't. It, there's too many to pick from. But I think what I want to talk about are ones that we just kicked off literally a week ago. So we're real excited about them. And this came from an idea that Emmanuel came up with. He came to me a couple of years ago and he said, what do you think of hibernation? What do you think of putting people into hibernation when they go to space? And I said, oh my gosh, don't be crazy. That's only in sci-fi movies. And he said, well, you know, they use that medically, clinically, when people have like a heart condition, a heart attack, or they have, you know, brain injury or other types of serious events, the, the medical profession will cool you down a little bit. So he said to me, well, why don't we look at decreasing metabolism because it could actually reduce resources as well as uh, protect tissues from damage if they're in a situation like where there's a lot of radiation and um, a lot of insults from the environment. So we actually ran a workshop, Emmanuel organized a workshop uh, and invited the best minds in the world. And it was really well attended. And I was I came away from that going, maybe this is possible. And in fact, uh, he helped write a solicitation topic and we had fabulous research proposals. People came up with terrific ideas. And we were so glad we recently announced this elections and we've had some really remarkable out of the box, crazy ideas, but actually really cool. And I'll just give you one example. There was one group that partnered with uh, a European group that had access to an early human species a homo sapien that used to hibernate. And so they are actually looking at the DNA of this early human to find out how is it and why is it and how how did humans hibernate at a time before humanity today? And can we actually find those genes that help human 
hibernate self safely? And can we do that to reduce resources and put people in a lower state for whatever reason? Maybe you wanted to sleep through over the pandemic. Maybe you want to sleep through some horrible event in your life. This might be a way to do that. And so I think of it as I like to call it the Jurassic Park for humans. So this one's really out there and I'm sure the others have their own favorite idea, but that one's my favorite. I mean, that, that's absolutely fascinating because you think about it, there are stories of people who have an accident and fall into a, a wintry lake or underwater and they're submerged for hours and hours and hours and they're pulled out and they're resuscitated. Yep. So you think that is kind of a hibernation for a period of time. So um, even humans today in our, in our time sur survive from this kind of hibernation state, right, that is accidentally induced. Just, just fascinating. Uh, Jimmy, how about you? Oh, this one's tough for me because as an engineer, they're all awesome <laughs> in terms of what these teams are doing and bound pushing the limits of, uh, of research and development. Um, I think the, one of the coolest ones that I've seen is the ability to uh, piggyback off radio frequency signals. So basically the signals that come out of your Wi-Fi and to be able to assess uh, your your sleep patterns, your movement, and even your respiratory rate. And so, uh, you know, so the waveforms that come off your uh, Wi-Fi router, they can actually apply machine learning algorithms to them and be able to analyze an individual's behavior from it. And so this was actually uh, something we discovered before COVID. And fortunately enough, with, when COVID, not, well, unfortunately COVID happened, but uh, one, of the, one of the things that we could salvage from it was uh, we asked this uh, investigator to see if they could put their um, their technology to use in uh, nursing home environments that at that time we didn't know what was going on with this virus. And so we obviously did not want to expose the staff and the care providers to try to check in with um, their their uh, residents and getting exposed. And so uh, because of this essentially a contact free way to monitor how well they're doing, are they moving around enough? Are they getting enough sleep? Um, how are they breathing? Uh, you know, they could we could monitor them without actually having to go into the room and then being exposed or being or exposing uh, the residents to uh, a potential contagion. So, um, so what's useful about this for space flight is uh, this is really a passive way to keep an eye on how the astronauts do in space. So without having to every single time come up, you know, find all the equipment that you need to you know, measure how you're sleeping, measure your respiratory rate, you know, the stuff that you do when you go into the doctor's office for your, your annual checkup. Now it could just be passively done as you go about your day because, you know, as we all know, Wi-Fi is everywhere in our lives now. And so, um, so it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's being able to piggyback off those signals to determine uh, and, and analyze it to see if the, that type of data can be pulled for, from it. And, and so there, this research is actually at the very early stages of, of finding other types of health parameters that could be also extracted from, from, these, uh, from the, the, waveform, the uh, radio frequency waveform analysis. So that to me is, is, I mean, just it blows my mind, you know, kind of like, you know, uh, Emmanuel had that photo, uh, had that picture of the tricorder, right? Basically this contactless way to see how you're doing. I mean, this is basically it. I mean, it's not in this little small handheld form factor, but we're starting to look at how we can do this without actually touching the actual patient. That is absolutely fascinating. I mean, I can think of my mind is just exploding thinking of all of the applications, particularly you think of in healthcare for people in hospitals and monitoring okay. someone's condition. I mean, it really could revolutionize the way that, you know, particularly people in a health crisis, how, how they're being monitored. If I could just add one more thing, there's some of the preliminary data from that COVID trial that Jimmy was referring to. Um, you could predict when somebody is about to deteriorate when and so within like a day or two that patient that she was following she could tell that they were getting worse with the respiration rate and that patient was in fact admitted to the hospital so she was able to detect that ahead of time so so if you can do that before that patient requires to be intubated and go back to the hospital then you can intervene you can give a medication some kind of intervene uh, uh, or oxygen ahead of time so that's what was so powerful about it and then she could also tell when somebody was getting better so you know that those people are okay, which was amazing to me. It's very preliminary, but we were very happy that we were able to put it to good use and helped out. That is absolutely fascinating. I mean, that really revolutionizes medicine if you can have those kind of predictive factors or, or a way using technology that suggests 
of a patient's improving or declining. Amazing. Well, Emmanuel, how about for you? And I actually loved your example of the tricorder because I was a Trekkie growing up. So that was incredible. But doctors are using these kind of technologies now, these new mobile devices um, to help assess how a patient is doing or identify issues or diseases. Yeah, that'll be the uh, the ultimate gadget, right? Both for, for Earth and for space. But uh, my favorite project, that's a really tough question. Uh, all of our projects are very unique, but um, I think I want to go with uh, the Letters um, RX, as we call it, uh, Dorit mentioned it uh, during her presentation. And this solves a, a very challenging part of going to deep space, and it's how do we ensure that the astronauts will have an adequate supply of medications that do not expire during their flight, right? Like that's that's a very big logistical issue. Normally medications expire after a year, right? If you buy them at your favorite pharmacy, but a mission to Mars that is going to take three years, how are you going to ensure that, you know, you will have enough medications for them for a, a, a big uh, number of, of possible medical conditions without stopping by your favorite pharma, pharmacy in waste space? So um, this is a very unique project that it looks at synthetic biology approaches. So basically what they did, um, they, are able to inject genes into the lettuce and they use uh, this really cool a gadget that is called a gene gun. So they inject the, the genes into the lettuce and then the lettuce um, starts producing molecules or proteins from these uh, genes, right? And those can be anything that you want. It could, it could be um, acetaminophen, it could be a hormone, it could be any other uh, pharmaceutical that you would like. So you have to you have to wait um, you know, a few days to, to, to have a, a good amount of, of um, of the medication so that you can you can use it, then you have to purify it. So there's still very preliminary results. But I think that technologies like these that do not require you to have a large mass requirements during space flight, combined with uh, predicting when a person is going to, to be sick, you can start producing the medication before someone gets sick so that you have it ready when that person actually gets sick. So uh, this, is, this is really, really interesting. And it's, I, I would say it's one of my favorite projects. If I can add, you know, in addition to having a limited amount of space for the medications uh, to take with you, you can't take every possible medication. That's the issue. You saw the size of those medical kits. That's probably too big compared to what's going to be taken to Mars in terms of the volume. The other thing is, is, is stability. So that's another reason why the lettuce project is so interesting and also the DNA project that I was talking to about making medications as needed because on a mission to Mars, we're talking probably from start to finish, we're, we're probably going to put medications on the surface or uh, food on the surface of the planet and wait for the humans to arrive there because we can't possibly send everything they're going to need for like a two, three year mission on that tiny craft going. So they have to sit there on the Mars surface and be exposed to radiation and probably have a really long shelf life. And most medications today, year and a half to max. And so shelf life is a problem. And so being able to make things, drugs as needed is really an important capability. That is, that is absolutely fascinating. When you think about it, most the origin of most medicines is from plants. I mean, that has been the case over time. And when I have an upset stomach, I go in my garden, I get some ginger and some mint, you know, from my garden. And But if you can actually tease a plant to produce a particular medicine, that, that is absolutely incredible. I was also really intrigued by, uh, and Dorit, when you talked about the, the um, stem cells on a chip and um, being able to send that into space and, and using that as kind of a predictive factor to understand how radiation may affect those cells before you send the whole organism, right, the whole human into space. Um, that, that is absolutely fascinating. Um, and so what other opportunities are there with stem cells and stem cell research um, that Trish is involved with? Because we know that's kind of the, the central building block, right, of creating all components of us as, as human beings. Uh, is the research happening around um, growing human organs or tissues or other kinds of things using stem cells? Yeah, so what's interesting about the zero gravity environment is uh, it allows tissues to form in space in without gravitational forces. So they look a little different in space. Now, these organs on a chip that we're talking about are being done here on the ground. We're not growing them in space. We're actually taking them and, and trying to study the particular person's responsiveness to radiation. But NASA actually has the national lab, and they are actually looking at growing organs and organoids themselves 
in zero gravity and, and they're having some very interesting findings with that. So in terms of our own interest in stem cell research, we believe that actually on the way to Mars, um, there may be significant effects of the radiation on the stem cells of the human. For example, your blood cells come from a stem cell population and they're particularly sensitive to the effects of ionizing radiation. So one can imagine that if people live in space for a long time and they are exposed to radiation, their stem cells may become damaged, may, de may become depleted. And so the idea is that perhaps someday we may need to give stem cell injections or, or factors that can induce the stem cells to proliferate, to make more of themselves. And guess what? It's just like reversing aging. Because what happens is, is as you get older, you're, you're making less and less new cells and your, the capability of your stem cells sort of decreases. And so some of the technologies that we're thinking about to regenerate the stem cells in humans that have lived in space for a long period of time um, are actually similar to what we see with aging um, and be, being able to reverse the aging phenomena. Now, we have to be very careful though, because whenever you cause proliferation or growth of stem cells, if those stem cells are damaged at all by radiation, now you've got cancer. And so we have to be extremely careful when we're thinking about an approach that involves stem cells to only help the proliferation, the, the growth of cells that are healthy. So it's a very complicated approach. One idea, which would be really easy, is if you simply brought with you your own stem cells that you took, you bank your own stem cells. And people are doing that with some of their babies today. I think there is a capability of taking cord blood and, and banking that because I think it contains a lot of stem cells just in case those individuals grow up and require uh, um, a, an injection of their own stem cells that is banked for them. Something like that for astronauts or maybe for all of us would be useful. Wow, that is, my mind is blown. That is absolutely <laughs> fascinating. Well, I, I wanted to talk about something personal for, for each of you because we're getting close to the end of our time and this is, conversation has been so incredible. We talk a little bit about how science fiction really inspires a lot of innovators and creators. And I'm curious when you were growing up, did you have a, fa a, fi a favorite a sci-fi character or sci-fi series that, that inspired you? Maybe start with Jimmy. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> Go ahead, Jimmy. <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah, so I did, I was a, a Trekkie as well uh, growing up. Um, and, you know, it, it's strange for me because I, when I, I think about this question, I don't have necessarily have a particular role model or a character that uh, that mimic me. Can maybe, you know, it's it's, it's strange because, it, uh, you know, maybe I missed it because of the the original series and then the, the ones that came about when I was growing up. There, you know, wasn't necessarily someone that uh, was was Asian in, in ethnicity, so it didn't. I didn't connect as well there. But uh, oddly enough, and maybe you know, read and may all chuckle at this. I think the character I related to most was probably Data, because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as an android, as a robot that just didn't quite fit in and was trying to fit in into a, into oh. a human culture, um, that was probably the one I related to most. Um, you know, my my space interest actually was more on the astronomy side. Um, it wasn't necessarily human uh, space travel. It was more like I did the stars are beautiful, astronomy is beautiful. Like I wanted to see in a, look through a telescope. Um, and then a lot of those dreams were kind of dashed in college when I realized I was really bad at physics. Um, but I was really good at biology and chemistry and engineering. And so that, you know, that that's the path I took. And so I still ended up in the space realm. Um, but that's a, just a weird sort of, you know, a, a pivot that I had to do in my life, even though um, it wasn't like a particular role model I had through through uh, sci-fi or anything like that, but I, the, the stars themselves were were my motivation um, for for what that's worth. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Um, how about you, Emmanuel? Yeah, well, I, I don't think I have a single one either. Um, I liked a lot of science fiction. Um, Actually, when I was younger, I wanted to be actually a pilot. I wanted to be a commercial pilot and fly airplanes. Um, then, you know, I went to medical school and then I never thought that I would be working in, in, in space. But, you know, my life brought me to this and it's it's the best thing that has happened uh, in my life. And since I've been in this field, I think that from the 
from science fiction, I think uh, Dr. McCoy. I really, I really like him. Uh, that's why I put the uh, his his handheld device. I think it's an inspiration for for a lot of people uh, in this field, and that's. Um, you know, in my case, this has been a source for continuous inspiration uh, as as we as we work in this field. Wonderful. And Dorit, how about you? And we're going to make it a perfect three, all of us, Star Trek. Uh, Star Trek, Star Trek, Star Trek. I was born in the 60s, of course, but it's it's a no-brainer for me. I had the biggest crush on Mr. Spock, and it turns out a lot of women did. But for me, I think the reason I was so interested in him uh, is because I am extremely emotional and, you know, and I also have a very calculating side and I'm always trying to like tamp down the emotions and both my colleagues here will agree, will agree with this, you know, controlling my emotions is always something that I struggle with. So I've always admired him, but, uh, yeah, it's kind of embarrassing to say Mr. Spock. Oh, I wouldn't be embarrassed. I think that well, those are wonderful descriptions, and I have to say, I was also a Trekkie, but I actually started out with Lost in Space, so uh, which uh, with predated uh, Star Trek. But I, I think again, that's the wonderful thing about space exploration, and I think for all of us, it captures our imagination, and it's why it's universally around the world, no matter what nation you go to, people know about NASA, they know about space exploration, and they find it really exciting and inspiring. Well, I'm sorry to say we've come to the close of our time together, and I want to thank you all for uh, the conversation today about Trish and the incredible work that you're doing. I want to thank you, you know, from the bottom of my heart and behalf of the, the public for all that you're doing to not only advance human exploration, but also advance research that benefits all of us here on Earth. So everyone, thank you for joining us for Space Center Houston's Thought Leader Series, Translational Research Institute for Space Health, or Trish. We look forward to having you join us on a future program. You can find them at our website at spacecenterhouston.org.